Um, it's a pleasure to have uh, Hector here with us. Um, Hector is um, it's a it, it's it's part of our research group. Kind of a, um, um, he doesn't work with us all the time, but he develops um, projects that we um, um, we we find interesting to develop together. And um, this particular one that he's going to present here today. Um, quantum cellular automata is, is something that I've been thinking um, for a while um, because I've been working with uh, cellular automata in the past. And um, given that um, there are already uh, some proposals for um, developing quantum cellular automata, I, I was wondering whether we could explore um, this a little bit further. And um, Hector being... Uh, fantastic skilled programmer and, and uh, um, interested in music. So we teamed up together and he came up with a very interesting uh, package and, and implementations and examples, which he's going to, to present for us now. The floor is yours, uh, Hector. Thank you very much. Please let me know if you can't see my slides. Uh, this, I'm Dr. Hector Miller Bakewell. I prefer very, very pronouns, and I'm pre presenting work on composition via quantum cellular automata. This is in collaboration with Professor Miranda and building on earlier classical work in that area and so on. So, the goal of this project is to facilitate musicians using quantum computers to aid composition, and we're going to do that building on existing classical techniques. Things coming up in this presentation. We're going to cover cellular automata. Then we're going to cover CAMU, the Cellular Automaton Music Generation System, perhaps based on work by, uh, sorry, based on work by Miranda, but has been adapted and used by many others. We're going to cover quantum cellular automata, in particular, partitioned quantum cellular automata, and then explain why. And then we're going to combine these things to make a quantum version of an existing classical system. So we're going to start with classical cellular automata. This is a description of what one needs to be to be a cellular automata. We have discretized space-time. Usually this means we have cells forming a grid in however many dimensions you want, and time advances in steps. We have bounded information propagation, where each cell's next state depends only on nearby cell's current states, including the cell itself. And these cells can only take on a finite number of values. For example, a bit, on, off, true, false. The best known example of this is John Conway's Game of Life. Here we have a, a rectangular 2D grid. Each cell is either on or off, and a cell's next state is determined by its own state and its current level of crowding. So just the number of neighbors that are, that are currently set to on. Um, given the technical issues earlier, I really hope this is a bit, uh, but this part will work. Uh, here is an example. You can actually just go online. This is, this is uh, playgameoflife.com. There are so many of these. I'm going to quickly show one of my favorite starting positions of John Conway's Game of Life. I have multiple. Um, if you aren't familiar with cellular automata, this is a fantastic way to have a play around and see the sorts of things that happen. In particular, remember, all of the rules are local and apply to each cell in, at the same time and the same rules are applied. While this goes off, I'll talk some more. Notice we started off with a state that had high rotational symmetry. None of the local rules can break that, and so we maintain that high level of symmetry as this goes on. Uh, we had a, this is a quite large system, but remember each of the rules is local. But we're starting to see these large global things happen, these large areas of activity that interact and couple. These four, uh, they're called gliders in the middle that are just narrowly missed hitting each other are stable in the sense that they will persist, but they move sideways as they do so, not diagonally as they do so. And now we fit a stable state whereby every cell that is on is part of a self-sustaining system. All this, those, small, those four squares will stay as four, uh, those squares of four cells will stay as squares as time goes on. Likewise, likewise, those um, diamond shapes uh, and the gliders will continue. So this is an example. Have a play around if you've not seen cellular automata before. Okay. Cellular automata 
Why are we interested in them? They originated in the 1960s with von Neumann and Ulam as tools to examine self-replicating behavior. We saw that with the gliders. Um, but you can get really complicated things that are self-replicating that will build copies of themselves and so on. But this is where they started. Since then, it's been used in image processing, ecology, sociology, lots and lots of computer game related things as well, because you know, small local rules developing emergent exciting systems. And that is why we are interested in them. Small rules, big effects. Have you been used in music as well? Of course, this is why we're here. So uh, Yanis Zanakis in the mid 1980s, credited as one of the first people to like, produce music based on some of these ideas, used cellular automata to, and I quote, create complex temporal evolution of orchestral clusters. Any further questions about that sentence will be directed towards Professor Miranda. But other examples at this time include uh, Bales in 1989, Melinda in 1990, and Professor Miranda in 1990. This brings us on to Camus, that cellular automaton music. The input is going to be the state of two 2D cellular automata. So they're going to have two grids, I think of them uh, holding them separately, and we go to pause single moment in time. And the output from that input is going to be a sequence of triads of varying pitch, composition, instrumentation, and timing. And once we've generated that, that sequence, we're going to advance both of the automata by one step and do this again, get another sequence of triads. And we continue this until we feel like we have enough triads. Some pseudocode here. In the original Camus, the root of a triad is determined in advance. We will change this later, don't worry. But we're going to loop through every cell in the first automaton. If that cell is set to true, then we're going to make a triad. The first interval of a triad will be the X position of the cell. The second interval of a triad will be the Y position of the cell. Here is a diagram to explain that. So left-hand side, we have our grid. We loop through. And in this instance, uh, black squares are set to true. Um, we're going to loop through all of them keep on hitting false until we hit that bottom left one of that Tetris block on the left. Its X position is four, its Y position is five. And so we're going to have our fundamental, we're going to go up four semitones to the first interval, and we're going to go up five semitones to the second interval. We then continue. We keep on going through, through these cells until we hit the next one to set to true. For example, X equals five and Y equals five. And that generates the next triad in our sequence. We keep on going, this particular state would generate four triads because we have four cells set to on. That's the intervals between the notes in the triad. We can also shift timings. We can decide wh which notes, which voices should join the triad and when. And so essentially stagger an entry and stagger the exit. So the way we, we do this in the system we built um, is to look at, we have the cell that we're looking at in the center then we label its neighbors by that diagram on the right. And so the value at A determines whether the bottom voice will be delayed or not. The value at B determines the middle voice, the value at C determines the upper voice, the value at D determines how big that delay is, either a quaver or a project. And then likewise, we can end voices early, and that's what O, N, M, and P do. So we have the notes, we have the timings, now we're going to decide on the instrumentation. This is what the second grid is for. We're going to keep on, we loop through, find a cell that's set to true. Then we go to look up that XY position in the other grid and use the value there to determine instrumentation. So here's an example. This is how um, a variation on, on Camus does it. Um, and you can see our two grids. Our top one only has true and false. Our bottom one, the states are, Celeste, xylophone, grand piano, and metalimba for any given cell. Definitely not true or false. But we have a cell at 11.6. It's set to true. So we're building a triad out of it. First interval is 11. Second interval is, second interval is 6. We use the neighbors in that upper grid to determine the timings. Then we look down to that lower grid to determine the instrumentation. Um, we're actually going to complicate that a little more because we want to give a, uh, an instrumentation for each voice in our triad. And so we go to use the same grid and actually we just use values A, B, and C to determine the instrumentation 
inside of, of the triad using the neighbors in the lower grid. It's just that that previous diagram was particularly beautiful and is from the, um, and is, and is from the um, original work in this field. So that was the Camus system. It's a little involved because we have quite a lot of moving parts in there. But the basic idea is that we have automata and we use that to generate triads. Quantum cellular automata. This is, hopefully will look very familiar, um, what we want from a quantum cellular automata. We keep discretized space time. So we still have cells in a grid and time advancing in steps. We keep the bounded information propagation. Each cell's next state depends on its current state and the nearby cell's current states. But we allow those states to now be quantum states. For example, a qubit. That, those are desiderata, but it doesn't actually tell us how to make one of these things. Um, and that's an important uh, point when I am approached as a software engineer to build one of these things. There is also a question of simultaneity. In the game of life and all other classical uh, cellular automata, the, we update each cell simultaneously. And we can do that in classical cellular automata because we're allowed to copy information. We are not allowed to do that in quantum states. And so we're gonna to have to find an interesting way to get around with that. Right. The work of Origi and Cartage back in 2012 showed that of the various different definitions of quantum cellular automata that existed in the literature, they could all be simulated by partitioned quantum cellular automata. It's a similar idea to Turing machines. In classical computing, you just have to show that whatever computer you built can simulate a Turing machine, and by extension, you know it can simulate anything else. We're going to define partitioned quantum cellular automata on the next slide, but it's important to note that they're universal by this result, but also they're constructive. We can actually build them. So a partition divides the cells at a given time, leave time out of this, we're just partitioning space into tessellating supercells. Here are three supercells. This is a seven by three grid. These are horizontal supercells of size seven. We then apply the same unit tree in parallel to each supercell. And because there's no overlaps, we're allowed to work in parallel. The full update step is going to be built from several such partitions of unit trees. So here are vertical supercells. And note that our bounded information criterion, that is in part, determined by which unit trees you apply to these supercells, but you can limit your supercells, providing they tessellate, in order to enforce that, that bounded information publication. So that's the theory. We're now going to build them. So let's go to some Python. I hope you enjoy it. The PQCA package was built for this purpose um, by myself on behalf of, 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 of the QQ project and it understands tessellations. This is going to partition a nine by four grid two different ways. Uh, the first way is one wide and two tall cells. So just two cells stuck together, basically. And the other is three wide and one tall. So three cells stuck together horizontally. Those are our partitions. We therefore, we now need some unit trees to apply. This is using uh, Qiskit, the package, handles anything that understands the chasm file format. And this is a two qubit circuit. We're going to play a controlled X um, operation from qubit zero to qubit one. And we're going to then play a Hadamard on qubit zero. And then this is a screenshot of what happens if you want to control that circuit. Likewise, we want a three qubit circuit for our three qubit cell. Similarly, this is a controlled X from zero to one and a not gate on qubit one, and then a controlled X from one to two. An update frame is a partition and the unit tree we're going to run on it. That's all the information that's contained in there. So we tell Python, we want the first update frame is our two qubit tessellation with the two qubit circuit. And the second update frame is the two qubit tessellation with the, sorry, the three qubit tessellation with the three qubit circuit. Bring us all the way to an automaton. Well, if our automat all an automaton is, is the initial state and a way of advancing to the next state. For us, 
That is the sequence of update frames we've just defined. We also need a backend that simulates a circuit. If you happen to have a quantum computer lying around, this is one of the few opportunities when I can actually expect some people here to have some quantum computers lying around, then you can set it up to that. But fundamentally, it just needs some way of evaluating the, the update. This is the update circuit, and I hope you can understand why I didn't particularly want to draw it out by hand. This is a tessellated circuit on, um, on nine by four cells. The quantum computer doesn't need to know anything about our tessellation. It just operates on a list of qubits, and so this has been drawn out on a list of qubits. Um, but here is our update circuit based on that example. And then just to really hammer that home, the purpose of this package is to build large circuits from tessellations of small circuits. Quick note about measurement. Once we've, we have our quantum states, we have our quantum update, we need to feed this into camera. But we also need to keep that information to feed back into the next update. Therefore, we need to copy information and that isn't allowed in quantum computing in general. There's some interesting ways around it, but for now, we are measuring the states of the qubit after the update circuit. This means that the lifetime of our quantum state is quite brief. It is from the initialization of the state based on classical data, through the update circuit, through to measurement, and then at which point it is collapsed. So here's an example. This is all black because we had all zeros as our start date. This is black as zero and white as one. I apologize for the inconsistency. So we started off nine by four grid, all zeros. After the first step, we see this. And I'd like to note that we have some lovely diagonal line, lines that persist. This is after the second step, the third step, fourth step, the fifth step. It is important to note that these diagonal lines are interesting global correlations that are larger than any of our supercells. We are indeed seeing interesting global structure based on the local rules. So we are simply seeing something that cellular automata promise, promise us. So let's put that together. We, we, we covered a classical system for turning outputs of automata, of automata into music. We built a quantum automaton. Let's put them together. So this is a small scale version of the camera. This is our nine by four grid. And we're going to split this into three parts. First strip on the left is going to determine the fundamental of our triads. So we're going to build a collection of triads with the same base node. And then once we've looped through the entire automaton, the automaton will advance and we'll get a new fundamental for the next set of triads. The teal colored four by four square, seconds so the rows two through five, determines which triads to play in the same way that we discussed at the start. And then the next grid is going to determine our instrumentation. That's our lookup grid to determine instruments for our voices. Now a process loop is simply this. We prepare the state, we apply the update circuit, we measure the state, then we copy. So we're now back in classical data. We feed the results into Camo, but we also feed the same results back into step one and continue until we've generated enough triads. Here's an example that was run on IBM Jakarta. It's a simplified example. IBM Jakarta only has seven qubits available, not um, 36. Um, and so we skipped out some of the temporal morphology. We, we've stripped out the things to do with instrumentation, but this is just an example of the camera system built on a quantum cellular automaton run on actual physical quantum hardware. Bring me to the conclusion. I suspect me that I've spoken far too quickly, sorry. <laughs> so our aim was to facilitate musicians using quantum computers to aid composition. And thanks to this package, in order to synthesize music using this protocol, a musician just needs to specify a collection of small quantum gates quantum circuits and tessellations. Remember, all I put in was a two qubit circuit and a three qubit circuit. We also need to make some stylistic choices about how to implement a move, which, uh, which instruments to use, how to, uh, um, how to enforce the temporal morphology, those sorts of questions, very musical questions. 
And this is, I hope you agree, a significantly lower barrier to entry for a musician trying to use this sort of system on, the, on quantum hardware than having to build any such large circuits and so on themselves. Artifacts. The main output of this is the PQCA Python package that handles partition quantum cellular, cellular automata that's on PyPI. If you, those of you who use Python, if you just do pip install PQCA, it should install everything and should ideally just work. If it doesn't, please let me know. Uh, there's also, as a side note, uh, a package called Musical Scales, where you give it a starting note and a mode, and it will generate the rest of the, of, uh, of the notes in that scale. Built as a nice um, side product, but it's how we determine the fundamentals of, the, of, these, um, of these outputs and so on. Tutorials also exist. They're hosted on the ICCMR um, quantum GitHub, uh, sorry, the ICCMR quantum page, um, which is the same page as this, this conference's uh, 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 own web page, so it should be easy enough to find. And these are Jupyter Notebooks. For those of you who haven't used them before, Jupyter Notebooks are interactive coding environments, but rather than just being code, you can also include all sorts of documentation, lots of diagrams. There are many, many more diagrams in those notebooks than in these slides. So if you would like a step-by-step -step process, which takes you from installing everything to getting MIDI and music XML output at the end, then, th then those are there for you. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. And finally, some acknowledgements. This work was funded by the QChain project. As I mentioned, the tutorial is available on the ICCMR website, and all the software created for this is, avail is available under the MIT license. That's an extremely permissive license. You can use it for essentially anything. You don't even need to tell us, but we'd appreciate it if you did. It's always nice to know that our work is being used somewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Hector. I think you may uh, stop sh sharing your screen. Thank you. So um, we have uh, five minutes for questions. If anybody has um, questions for Hector, uh, what I can see here on the chat is well done, very nice idea. Um, clap, clap, thanks. Thank you so much, Hector. So I think the general audience uh, really enjoyed your, your talk. Um, there's a new question in the Q&A, if you switch. There to is it. a new question in the Q&A. Oh, there you go. Uh, Jim Weaver, um, he would like to see the circuit evolution process again. Um, Make a matter sharing my screen. Yes, please. Wonderful, this is screen one. Thank goodness, sorry. I, I promise I have a PhD in, in, in computing. Um, so, this one, yeah. <clears throat> so, possibly this screen. So th this is the uh, full. This is the full circuit. Um, unfortunately, this is Jim. Would, this. Would, would, would you like to type uh, what exactly you want to see? Uh, then um, I can ask Hector to to show us. There are requests um, for a music demo. I will quickly say that I was not feeling brave enough in my own technological abilities to successfully play MIDI files over Zoom. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I applaud the presenters who came before me who successfully managed to do so, but I was not brave enough. The GitHub repository, I believe, contains the, some of the first produced um, uh, MIDI files through this system, but also if you follow the tutorial, you, you can create your own. Yeah, Marcos is asking if we have a, a music demo. And uh, Jim Weaver also asked, um, uh, to be completely honest with you, uh, we just finished this, um, this project very recently. And um, you know, I wanted Hector to produce this because I have a, a composition in mind I wanted to produce with it. And unfortunately, I didn't have time yet. You know, uh, time is, is precious these days, but um, it is coming. I, I already started. Um, it will be... Um, a piece for um, an ensemble, um, which I'm going to generate the patterns and uh, I will import the uh, MIDI outputs into a, a scoring system, uh, a musical scoring um, editor. 
and um, get some um, an ensemble to play the, the music. Um, if you are interested, I can show you eventually um, pieces that I composed with uh, classical cellular automata. Um, but I, I guess um, the interest now is, is to see what the quantum will produce. So uh, watch this space, that's what I say. But as Hector mentioned, um, if you run the Jupyter notebooks, you are able to generate MIDI files yourself. You can see the music notation uh, that the, uh, the system produces. Um, you can import the, uh, the materials onto a, a score editor. So it, it's all ready to be used. Uh, and uh, people out there are, are very welcome to, to, to take advantage and use this uh, and explore. And because it's all in Python, you can build the code on top of what Hector already provided as, as examples. So I, I, I'd like to uh, address a comment by James Weaver in the chat. Uh, the question is, how does the circuit evolve? Um, the circuit is fixed between updates. The state that is produced at the end of this, that is measured, is then used as a, um, whereas then a separate state preparation system that turns that classical information into qubits to be then fed back into this same circuit. The circuit is consistent. It is our collection of local rules. It is the, but the state that comes out of it has the global immersion properties. Okay, so I think, okay, Jim got it. Thank you. Um, let's see, there is a more general question, uh, blah, blah, imagine, oh, wow, this is a very difficult. We have some paragraphs, give us a moment to read this. <laughs> yeah, so a general question, this is Marcus, um, biofaction. Marcus is a biologist and uh, works with uh, uh, biocomputing and all sorts of interesting stuff. So a general question for Marcus, a general question. Apart from authenticity, couldn't, couldn't you also take a classic computer program and simulate the quantum computing outcome? Yes, you can. Yes, of course. Uh, it depends because if you have very complex processes, um, then the simulation on classical computers will get so big that you know, uh, computers would not be able to, to do them. So that's why you need quantum. Um, imagine a Turing test where the listener has to decide whether the music was created by a quantum computing source or a regular quantum random generator. How could you track the Turing test? I don't think we could do this Turing test now, Marcus. Uh, that's my opinion. Um, um, at, as we are now, the... Uh, Everything that we present here that we can do on, in the quantum realm is perfectly possible to simulate classically. Uh, but what we are doing, I think, as a community, we are preparing the ground for when things become complex and for, for when we have those machines that will enable us to, to scale up all these experiments that we are doing now classically. Um, some of the papers already presented today gave glimpses of how quantum can come into the classical realm and expand the, the universe to, um, you know, the, the, the realm where we are now classically into something that we, um, we, we may wonder what will happen. We don't know. Um, I don't think I know what will happen. So I, I, if I may quickly interrupt concerning the, 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 the simulated quantum computing um, comment. These, the, uh, these images we're currently looking at were um, through a simulated quantum computer. It is worth noting that if you had a, a probabilistic cellular automaton, I do not believe you will see these, the, um, uh, the, these global correlation properties. This is spooky action at a distance, but admittedly on quite a small distance, but still larger than any of our supercells and our circuits individually could affect. So we are seeing something here like a quantum correlation that would not show up in a probabilistic cellular automaton, I believe. Can't do that in my head. Correct, correct. Okay, so I think we are done now. Um...